afternoon, everyone. We're at the last stretch, and then we can have that first beer of the day. Some of you, third beer of the day, I've seen. Um, so, Tari script, non-interactive protocols for Mimblewimble, or perhaps a better title is how we added scripting to Mimblewimble. So, uh, the roadmap for the talk. Essentially, uh, before I can talk about Tari script, I have to introduce Mimblewimble and Tari. This is a Monero crowd, and I assume not everyone here is aware of what Mimblewimble is. Um, so I'm going to have to take a little bit of a dive into, you know, Tari, how it relates to Monero, um, what makes it interesting, and how confidential transactions work, and why it's hard to do scripting in vanilla Mimblewimble. Um, and then also why we need it uh, in Tari, right? So Tari uh, is a fast, scalable, private digital assets protocol, which is merge on, merge mind on Monero. So that's the main link. Uh, the second link is uh, that the founder, one of the founders of Tari is none other than Fluffy Pony. Um, and uh, so there's kind of a, a rich history between the two projects. Um, and judging by some of the conversations I've had this weekend, uh, rumors of Tari's demise have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, we've been working hard for the last couple of years uh, to build this, this protocol. Um, and, and it's architected on two layers. So the layer one is... Uh, what we call the Minotauri chain. Uh, this is a proof-of-work based protocol um, built on Mimblewimble, hybrid proof-of-work, 60% of the blocks are merged mined with Monero. And underneath that is a second layer, which is the digital assets network. That's where the smart contracts run. That's where all the cool and interesting stuff is. Um, uh, and I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Um, what I am going to talk about is how we uh, enhance Mimblewimble to allow the link between the layer one and layer two. All right, so Mimblewimble 101, what is it? Mimblewimble is basically like Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency protocol, but it has confidential transactions. Okay, so if you look at a, a block explorer for Bitcoin, you can see the entire transaction graph. You can see who sent how much and to whom. Um, so it makes the perfect surveillance coin, ultimately. Uh, Mimblewimble uh, is far more private. It has what I call OK privacy. Um, very technical term. Um, and the reason why I say that is because the, um, if you look at a block explorer for a Mimblewimble chain, uh, all you see are inputs and outputs. Uh, and there's no way to tell which inputs are related to which outputs. It's essentially a coin jo join on the block level. Um, and that helps obfuscate the uh, transaction graph. And of course, all the values have been hidden. And I'll get into exactly how that works in a second. Of course, the, uh, the problem is, is that a, a committed and a motivated adversary can scan the network, and if they put enough nodes in the network, they can actually monitor the peer-to-peer -peer network for transactions, which are you know, atomic things, um, and reconstruct the transaction graph in that way. So you know, the privacy for Mimblewimble is good, it's okay, it's not fantastic, certainly nowhere near as good as Monero's. What Mimblewimble does do well is, uh, is its scalability. And so, you know, what the security guarantees or the security trade-offs that Mimblewimble makes is that once you've spent a transaction, uh, you, can, you can just throw it away. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, in order to validate the, the state of the chain, all you really need is the set of unspent outputs. So all the, all the coins that are in circulation, uh, you just need to know what those are and the emission curve, and you can essentially do a trustless verification of the state of the chain. There's a bunch of other housekeeping that you have to do, but in terms of the accounting, that's it. And um, you know, because of that, if Bitcoin had to be done in this way, you could probably throw away 80% of the blockchain. So it's a good scalability solution, um, but it's also interactive. Now, <laughs> um, there's some math ahead. I was going to say, you know, if you're offended by math, there's a trigger warning. But given some of the talks we've had today, I, I guess that horse is bolted. So. Um, all I want to say to you is that uh, if you've got high school maths, you will be f able to follow along with my talk. It's, I've, I try to keep it as kind of accessible as possible. All right, so let's start with how confidential transactions work. The key problem is here is how can a node uh, take a transaction that it receives on the blockchain or in the, in the network and know that we're not creating or spending coins or you know, doing funny things without actually knowing the amounts involved. It sounds like black magic, right? <clears throat> so so um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm about to reveal how that's done. So let's take an example transaction. Alice has some output. She has 100 Tari. She wants to send some to Bob. And so the, uh, the transaction is going to look something like this. You know, she's going to spend that, that output. Uh, create, uh, Bob needs to have an output after the fact. She'll have some change, and of course, he needs some fees. Now, in a, in a, blo in a, pro a blockchain like Bitcoin, uh, where everything's out in the clear, the nodes can do the accounting directly. So they'll see the transaction, and they'll simply compare the outputs and the inputs and say, are they equal, right? Do the outputs minus inputs equal zero? In this case, the uh, outputs are uh, 10 for Bob, 89 change for Alice, assuming there's like a one Tari fee, and she's spending 100, and we add that up, we get zero. Okay, cool. No one's doing anything nefarious. Um, but how do we do this without knowing the values? So you've seen this word a couple of times today already, Peterson commitments. So what is actually happening here? So in the kind of the cryptography that we use for this type of thing, um, elliptic curves or ECC, um, essentially the normal rules of arithmetic apply, right? Addition and multiplication work the same way as any high school algebra problem. So you can take any number K, um, and we multiply it some, by some constant g, and you get some value p, all right? So k times g equals p. Now, in ECC, that, that's easy to do. Multiplication is easy, so we can calculate p. The thing is that if I give you p, you cannot say p divided by g. You'll never be able to figure out k, not without, you know, an insane amount of computing power. I say never, but technically the purists will say that's not true, but in practice, you basically cannot find k. So all the orange values are public, all the white values are secret, and um, you, you may be starting to guess that the white values are secret keys and the, and the orange values are public keys, and this is kind of essentially public-private key cryptography right here. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is commitments, right? So what we do next is, um, because the normal rules of arithmetic apply, you know, the good old commutative rule and the, dis the associative rule, distributive rule of maths where like A plus B is the same as B plus A, or A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. You know, you can do all the same arithmetic tricks with, um, uh, with, uh, with ECC values. Um, so when we create a commitment, we're actually adding two things together. We, we take some secret value times by a constant and another secret value times by a constant and we sum them together, we get what we call a commitment. And if you have two different commitments, you have this nice property that if you add these two commitments together to get a third commitment, C, uh, it's exactly the same answer as if you had added those two secrets together and those two values together and done the commitment math in that route, um, and you get the same answer. Okay, and uh, that's called the homomorphic property of of the commitments. Okay, and that's, and that's kind of the secret source for, um, for Mimblewimble. So w let's add some semantics to these commitments. So what we have is uh, in the Mimblewimble output, it's actually represented by these commitments here. And it's the sum of some value times g, which that secret value is actually what is the spend key. Knowing that value lets you be able to spend the output. And the actual value of the output is, is multiplied by h. So those, those are the two secret values of a commitment in Mimblewimble. Um, but what we're showing, what we expose in the blockchain are just, is just the sum. So once, once I've added these two together, there's nothing you can do. You'll never be able to separate them again. It's like me saying to you, the sum, I've got two numbers in my head, and they add up to a million. What are the two numbers? There's no real way for you to figure out what the two numbers are without brute forcing every single combination, right? And uh, the number is, the, the, the sum here doesn't go up to a million, it goes up to an ast astronomically huge number. So there's no practical way of separating these two. Okay, so with that introduction out of the way, let's see how the same balance on Tari is done versus how it was done on Bitcoin. So in the same way, you know, Alice is spending an output to Bob, getting some change and doing a fee. And because in Mumblewimble these are represented by commitments, there's going to be a CA, a CB. Her CA prime is her change commitment. 
Um, so that's got a value of 100 and some spend key. Bob's has got a value of 10 and some spend key, and her change is 89. And, and if we do the balance here, we're just adding these commitments together, inputs, uh, outputs minus inputs, and because of that associative rule, uh, we can combine all the H terms together and we combine all the G terms together. And you'll see here, uh, this is kind of cool, like the, the values cancel out, right? Same as on this side. But on the Gs, we've got the sum of, what effectively is the sum of all the secret keys, all the spending keys. Uh, and that's like the residual, that's what's left over. All right, so, so what, 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 is, what is the significance of this? Is that the, when, you, when you've got the sum of all the keys and you multiply by G, this is like a public key. And when you have a public key, you can create a digital, a digital signature signing with the secret key. So what we do in Mumblewimble or in Tari is that a node will receive just a bunch of commitments. It'll do the balance in the usual way and then check if the result is the public key corresponding to a signature that the spenders provide with the transaction. And if that signature checks, then they know that the H values must have canceled out. And that's how we know that no coins have been created or destroyed, but we, don't have, we have no idea what the values were. Okay, that concludes our lesson. All right, so let's see, what, what is the spend authority here? Um, on, on Bitcoin, Alice will be providing, uh, you know, she'll be sending, She'll be providing the uh, spending script for her output, uh, the locking script for the change, uh, and Bo Bob's output. And effectively, Bob provides nothing, right? This is completely non-interactive. Alice sends everything herself. On Tari, um, Alice provides knowledge of KA and, and, and VA, so you know the output that she's spending. She'll, have this, she'll create a, a secret for her change. Um, but she can't create the secret for Bob's output. If she did, she'd be able to spend his output, right? So Bob needs to come in into the story and, and provide his secret, his KB. And that's why Mimblewimble's interactive. Uh, and that makes things challenging when you want to do things like tip jars and, you know, uh, withdrawing from exchanges and mining pools. Uh, you know, you can't, a mining pool can't be expected to wait for everyone to come online to pay their, their dividends and so on. So this is a challenge and something that Atari, we wanted to resolve. Um, we also had other things we want to do, um, you know, between Atari's layer one and layer two, and that is things like doing peg outs to the side chain or to the layer two, um, doing covenants and, and all sorts of other things to manage our smart contracts. <coughs> so, you know, let's just take a step back. We can summarize. Vanilla Mumble Wumble transactions are confidential, lacquer. Um, they're interactive. <coughs> Um, and the other thing is it's just math, right? There's nothing fancy. It's not like Bitcoin where you can add scripts. So, you know, some of you might not know, when you send to a Bitcoin address, there's no real, it's not really going to an address. There's a script that gets evaluated and, um, you know, the, the unlock script has to match the signatures and so on. Um, but with Mumblewumble, it's essentially just a signature. It's just maths. So then how do we go about implementing Atomic swaps, sidechain pegs, one-sided payments, view keys, covenants, hash time, lock contracts, and, and stupid things like BRC20s. Um, thing is, well, in vanilla Mumblewimble, you can't. You can't do it. So, end Tatari script. 15 minutes in, and we finally get to the, the crux of the talk. So, how did we do this? Well, it comes down to two things. We modified one consensus rule, and we added another one. So, the first thing we did is that the... We changed the rule, the spending rule for Tari outputs is that in, um, you need to, in order to spend a Tari output, you need to know two things. The spend key, which is the existing Mimblewimble rule, you need to know the, the, the K value. And now you also have to know something that we've introduced called the script key, and that's the extra, extra rule. There's also a new consensus rule that says when you create an output or when you, you must provide a script with that output, and when you spend it, you can add some input, you can provide whatever input you want to the script, but the script must run correctly um, by the consensus rules, by the, um, by the node. And the result must be a single value, and that single value must be a public key. And then the spender must prove knowledge of the private key that corresponds to that public key. So that private key is what we're calling the script key over there. <clears throat> so, how do we implement this in Tari? 
uh, we, we invented something called Tori Script Script, um, and it's inspired by Bitcoin Script. It's a stack-based stack language, um, very similar to Forth or Bitcoin Script. It's not Turing complete, so there's no loops in it. Um, and, but it's got opcodes for things, you know, normal mathematic operations. Uh, you can do signatures, you can do hashing. Uh, there's some blockchain metadata you can pull in, like the block height. Um, and it has conditionals, so you can do some, some funky conditional logic. So it's, it's kind of smart contract light. Um, it's got strict limits uh, enforced by the consensus rules and size and complexity, so there's no halting problem issues. Every script is guaranteed to finish. So let's look at a, some examples. So the easiest one is what does the standard mimble, the standard interactive Tari transaction look like? And in this case, the script is the simplest strip, script you can think of. It's a no-op. It doesn't do anything. And so when the spender is spending, they just stick any public key that they want as the input. The uh, no-op script runs, leaving that key on the stack. And that satisfies the rule. The script is executed, and there's a single public key on the stack. And unless the spender is a complete moron, uh, they will know the private key to that public key that they've just pushed up. And presumably, they already know the spend key, so they satisfy the, uh, the new consensus rules. So this is, again, requires interactivity and um, doesn't, doesn't deviate from standard mobile mobile. I think something that's more interesting is one-sided payments. So now Alice can send something to Bob, and Bob is not involved at all, similar to a Bitcoin transaction, right, or a Monero transaction. And, th and the script in this case is that Alice will, the, uh, the script is to push Bob's public key onto the stack, and when Bob spends it, he provides no input. So you know it will execute, and it'll just have Bob's public key on the stack. Right. So that's that takes care of that part. What about the spend key? So when Alice is creating this transaction, she creates a shared secret between her and Bob using something called Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and it's just it's a standard technique for. Um, two parties to create a shared secret, and no observers can figure out what that secret is, but those two parties know it. It's a shared secret. Now, that wouldn't work in normal Mimblewimble because once Alice has broadcasted the transaction, she'd know that secret so she could spend Bob's output, right? So, not ideal. However, now with Tari script, she doesn't know the private key to Bob's public key. So, out of the two of them now, only Bob is able to spend that coin, and Bob's your uncle. Um, You've got one-sided payments. You could do even funkier things like, uh, you know, Elizabeth earlier was talking about atomic swaps, and you want, you know, you need a refund uh, condition in, in that sort of thing. This is the script that would say, before block 4000, for example, um, only Bob's public key would be pushed onto the stack, but after block 4000, uh, either Alice's or Bob's public key would be left on the stack um, after this runs, and so both of them could spend it. So up until block 4,000, only Bob can spend. Above, beyond 4,000, either Alice or Bob can spend, so she can get um, her funds back in case of a, you know, a failed atomic swap, as an example. All right, so that's, that's essentially a, a rush through. That's the movie version of Tari's script. Uh, I've left out a lot of detail for that. You've got to go and read the book. Um, and... Uh, you know, the things I've left out is that the, uh, the basic idea of Tari script as I presented it here was something like I thought of in you know, a couple of days, put the initial spec together in a week or so, uh, but it took us the bit, better part of a year to actually get the protocol finished and in a place where, that we think is secure. Um, and uh, because there are a couple of problems with the, uh, the way it's presented, and in order to dig into that, you might want to ask me about cut through. Uh, and how that stuffs up the whole Tari script idea, uh, how we managed to resolve those problems and fix them. Um, and once that's done, you might want to ask me what horizon attacks are and how that can stuff up the Tari script uh, approach and what we do to handle that in Tari. Um, but in the interest of time, I, you know, we can discuss that over a beer. Uh, you know, ultimately, as I said, this took a better part of a year. It was an absolute massive team effort. Um, so I, I really have to acknowledge the entire Tari core development team um, for you know, taking the RFCs, finding vulnerabilities, fixing it, finding another vulnerability, um, and iterating again and again, and every time getting a little bit closer to 
to the goal. Um, and also to David Burkett, who was experiencing similar issues when he was trying to implement one-sided payments for Litecoin extension blocks. Um, and you know, we're really indebted to him. He, he, he contributed a lot as well. And I think it's fantastic that we work in an industry where people on ostensibly competing projects can like work together um, to solve common problems. You know, it's like we're more more en engrossed with solving the tech problems than trying to win some like arbitrary competition, right? So thanks to those guys. Um, that's it. Let's, let's go and have a beer. <laughs> <laughs>